Njeni Mungu aliyeteka sayari sifuri shani zake aliyewaondoa kwenye giza kamtoa mwana wake ulimwengu wote upate uokovu Njeni Mungu aliyeteka sayari sifuri shani zake aliyewaondoa kwenye giza kamtoa mwana wake ulimwengu wote upate uokovu waliwenyamazisha ondoe ni kelele zenu hapa yesu kawajibu sikize nimba wenda mbele mbaita imba iwapo mtanyamba za kimya ninayo bari kukaririsha nizake aliyenipenda katika majanga hata wakati wa roho sitachoka mwenda mbele mbaita imba iwapo mtanyamba za kimya ninayo bari kukaririsha nizake aliyenipenda katika majanga hata wakati wa roho sitachoka waliwanyamazisha ondoe ni kelele zenu hapa yesu kawajibu sikiza nimba wenda mbele mbaita imba iwapo mtanyamba za kimya ninayo bari kukaririsha nizake aliyenipenda katika majanga hata wakati wa roho sitachoka wenda mbele mbaita imba iwapo mtanyamba za kimya ninayo bari kukaririsha nizake aliyenipenda katika majanga hata wakati wa roho sitachoka fanyeni kazi macho imewadia tangaza wasikie ujumbe wa kurejea kwa Yesu nitajela neno la kelime kitamizizi ulimwenguni fanyeni kazi macho imewadia tangaza wasikie ujumbe wa kurejea kwa Yesu itajela neno la kelime kitamizizi ulimwenguni wali wanyamazisha ondoe ni kelele zenu hapa yesu kawajibu sikiza nimba wenda mbele mbaita imba iwapo mtanyamba za kimya ninayo bari kukaririsha nizake aliyenipenda katika majanga hata wakati wa roho sitachoka mwenda mbele mbaita imba iwapo mtanyamba za kimya ninayo bari kukaririsha nizake aliyenipenda katika majanga hata wakati wa roho sitachoka wenda mbele mbaita imba iwapo mtanyamba za kimya ninayo bari kukaririsha nizake aliyenipenda katika majanga hata wakati wa roho sitachoka waliwanyamazisha ondoe ni kelele zenu hapa yesu kawajibu sikiza nimba wenda mbele mbaita imba iwapo mtanyamba za kimya ninayo bari kukaririsha nizake aliyenipenda katika majanga hata wakati wa roho sitachoka wenda mbele mbaita imba iwapo mtanyamba ninayo bari kukaririsha nizake 
aliyenipenda katika majanga hata wakati wa raha sitachoka waliwanyamazisha wanaweni kelele zenu hapa Yesu kawajibu sikiliza nimba wenda mbele maeta imba iwapo mtanyamba za kimya ninayo hariko karere shani zake aliyenipenda katika majanga hata wakati wa raha sitachoka Mwenda mbele maeta imba iwapo mtanyamba za kimya ninayo hariko karere shani zake aliyenipenda katika majanga hata wakati wa raha sitachoka waliwanyamazisha ondoweni kelele zenu hapa Yesu kawajibu sikiliza nimba wenda mbele maeta imba iwapo mtanyamba za kimya ninayo hariko karere shani zake aliyenipenda katika majanga hata wakati wa raha sitachoka nasema mwenda mbele maeta imba iwapo mtanyamba za kimya ninayo hariko karere shani zake aliyenipenda katika majanga hata wakati wa raha sitachoka God is good. What do you say to the choir? Yeah. That was wonderful. Uh, I know those who have spoken before us had already welcomed us to the today's part of the program. Nevertheless, I want to still take this opportunity to welcome each and every one of us, particularly to this program that we are about to begin. Uh, without much ado, I would invite us to go with me to the book of Revelation chapter 6, verse 17, from whence the servant of the Lord will be able to extrapolate the message of this hour. And the Bible reads, it's a question by the way, it reads, For the great day of his wrath is come, and we shall be able to stand. I repeat, for the great day of his wrath is come, and we shall be able to stand. Uh, let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of for the gift of life. Father, you've called. Good morning. I hope that we uh, slept well. The day has been kind to us so far. So I, I've been given a big title there. I hope I will not disappoint you. My name is uh, Evangelist. I think I will use that from now. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, so, Emmanuel, thank you. Uh, so, today, I think it's a good day. And even see, uh, I am, let's like say, dripped in my shirt of many colors. Almost uh, reminiscent of Joseph. We all, we all want to be men of integrity. You know, we see temptation and we... You know, we, all, we all want to be men of integrity. You know, we see temptation and we, we reject it uh, because, because we have chosen to be uh, loyal to God as we have understood the love of God. So when you see me in my, in my drip, you know, I, I, it's cold, but, but I have to shine. Just remember that... Uh, <laughs> yes, in and out of season. Season. But uh, just remember, at least if you see me with this chart, just remember the story of Joseph. 
and remember his integrity. So we'll, we'll, we'll dive into the lesson for today, but there's something, I think it's good we, we remember what we learned yesterday and then we'll pray and then we start. So I will, I will summarize what we learned today, what we learned yesterday with a, with a, with a statement, a compilation, uh, the new, a new life, revival and beyond. So that will be NL 59.3 says that the ethics of the gospel acknowledge no standard but the perfection of the divine character. I'll repeat, the ethics of the gospel acknowledge no standard but the perfection of the divine character. Uh, we will, I think we'll get to study why, why that is true. But yesterday we studied that, uh, you know, we, we made that empathy conclusion that if we are to get to heaven, then we are to get there by keeping the commandments of God that we may stand before God uh, being faultless and without any guile. And we understood that this, uh, this process is tough and the responsibility lays heavily on Jesus Christ. And we understood that through the gospel, you know, we have this opportunity to perfect this divine character. We have that opportunity to experience that blessing. We have that opportunity to be prepared and to be thoroughly uh, washed and made perfect to the point that we can stand before the face of God faultless and blameless. And we concluded by using uh, Paul's word in uh, Romans, chapter 1 and verse 16 onwards, which, where we say that for we are not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to anyone who believes, both the Jew and the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, that the just shall live by, by faith. So if we are to experience this perfection, it must mean that we are supposed to delve deep, uh, deeper into the gospel. And it gels well with the, with the lesson that we, with the, I think with the theme for this camp meeting where we are looking at the, I will go uh, with the three angels' messages. And we know that we are preaching the gospel in the context of the three angels' messages. And then just to remind us, we say that the gospel is not a generic message. It is a message for a, de for a definite time and a season. Although, although my style may not acknowledge season, the gospel acknowledges the season. And we read clearly in Mark, I think we, when, when, we looked at Jesus Christ when he came preaching the gospel. He said that the time was fulfilled, pointing to that uh, prophecy that has been emphatically stated in Daniel chapter 9. That the gospel is always timely. It takes into account the prevailing circumstances of the time, but its entire goal is to make people righteous. Okay, so that's where we were. And the question that we're asking ourselves is then, how can we experience uh, this perfection that is so richly offered in the gospel? So let's pray. And then we'll get to the lesson for today. Heavenly Father, what in heaven? Uh, you've provided a means through which we can be elevated from the sin and the corruption of this world to a point that we can be able to stand before your throne faultless and blameless. Now we want to discuss these matters, and they're heavy matters. And we are weak and frail mortals. Our minds are prone to wonder, and these things are difficult for us. But we present ourselves to be taught of you. You understand each of us individually. You're patient with us. You can teach us. You can bring this truth in a way that will touch each one, each one of us individually. So we invite you to be with us. We invite you to guide us through this teaching. And this I pray in Jesus' name. Okay. So we read uh, Revelation chapter 6. And that was our key text. But before we get to Revelation chapter 6, there is one thing that I would want us to cover. Now, uh, I'm not digressing from Revelation chapter 14. Uh, I've not you know, gone back. Backslided. Okay, uh, we will get to Revelation chapter 6, but there is one thing that it's important for us to, to cover. Let's go to Luke chapter 19 and verse 42. Let's go to Luke uh, 19 and verse 42. Okay. So we'll, we'll read together. Well, let me read from verse 41 and then we'll read verse 42. Says that, and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, if, if you had known, even you, at least in this day, the things which belong unto your peace, but now they are hid from your eyes. So Jesus Christ too was weeping over Jerusalem. And the reason, and the reason why he was weeping over Jerusalem was because the, the, the Jews or the, or the people who dwelt in that city had rejected him. And he's making, a, he's making a very interesting statement. He's telling them that if they had known, at least in this day, the things which belong to their peace, but now they are hid from their eyes. So it's almost in a way that Jerusalem was ignorant of the things which belong to their peace. And at this moment, it was so late that those things were hid from their eyes. 
they will no longer have an opportunity to understand and to learn about the things which belong to their peace. You know, it's interesting to find out that, you know, that the scripture, I think much of the Old Testament came to us through the ministration of, through, you know, through, through the Jews. They were first exposed to the scripture. But when the Savior came to them, they were unprepared to receive the Savior. They didn't even recognize him. Yet they had been prepared about the kind, they had been prepared sufficiently by the prophets about the nature and the work of the Messiah. Yet they did not know him when he, when he came. So much to the point that Jesus Christ says that in that day, they did not know the things that belonged to their peace. And at, the, at this moment, they were hid from their eyes and they lost the opportunity to actually meet and experience the benefit that came with the service of the Messiah. And it's this, this particular ignorance is actually, it's, it's, it's without excuse. Because the, let, let's, 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 die, let's, let's go to Daniel chapter, chapter 9 and verse 20. I know the nature, the, 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 the life of Jesus Christ is almost dramatized in the entire Old Testament. So much to the point that you can actually say when, you, when, when, when these gospel writers were writing, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were just plagiarizing, you know. They, plagiar they, they realized that uh, these prophets were speaking about a great person, so they, you know, they summarized the statements. Kind of like what uh, some notorious people do. Uh, they, have not, they have not submitted a lab report. So they, you know, they combine the best from the minds of many, and then they come up with a super report. And they're usually the people who do well in class. The, the, the life of the Messiah was clearly traced. You know, his work, where he would be born, how he would be born, you know, even his poverty, everything about his life was clearly recorded by the prophets that when he came to earth, you know, anyone who had spent some time reading the Bible, anyone who had spent some time, you know, reading the Bible with a focus on the Messiah would not be mistaken about the identity and the nature and the nature of the work that Jesus Christ came to, to do. But what, so much, you know, it is, it is so bad to the point that even the time when he would be born, was, they were actually told, Actually told, um, at this time. Let's go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 20 to verse, 20, verse 27. But our focus will not be on the time. I think this, uh, Daniel chapter 9 is so common. If, if it's not common, so what do you say? You're in trouble. But it's common. Uh, you're not in trouble. That's why we are here. That's why we are, we are, we are here. So let, let, me, let, me, let me read Daniel chapter 9 from verse 20 to verse 27. This is about the work of the Messiah. Remember, the, the, the Jews were ignorant about, about the work of the Messiah. They expected a political king, you know, someone who will gather the hordes of, of the army of, of Israel and lead them in a triumphant conquest against the Romans and against the Gentiles and establish Israel as a, as a world power. Almost all roads would now lead to Jerusalem. But God had given them clear directions as to the work that the Messiah was supposed to, to do. Now it says in uh, Daniel chapter 9, in verse 20, we'll, we'll read on. It says that, And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sins and the sins of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God uh, for the holy mountain of my God, yeah, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel whom I had seen in the, in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, Touch me about the time of the evening oblation. Okay, there, are, there are interesting things there. Very, very interesting things there. Uh, but we might, we, can, we, can, we might study them at a later date. So Daniel was confessing his sins. And then Gabriel comes and he touches him at a very specific time. The time of the evening oblation. There is significance to that, but we will cover it uh, perhaps later. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I am now come, to give, I am now come forth to give you skill and understanding. So there was, there, was a part, there was a specific part about the prophecy that was given in uh, Daniel chapter 8 from verse 14 onward that Daniel did not understand. And Gabriel now has come to, you know, to make the vision plain, to give him sufficient information that he might be able to understand this vision. Now we'll jump to verse 24. It says that 70 weeks are determined upon your people, upon your holy city, to finish the transgression and to make the end of sins and to make the reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness to seal up the vision and the, and the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. I'll repeat, after these 70 weeks, what, was, what, what were these people supposed to achieve? Let me just read. At 70 weeks, okay, 70 weeks determined is a cutoff from the 2,300 days uh, upon your people and upon your holy city to finish the 
Let's read together to finish the transgression. And then again, what? To make an, to make an end for, for sin, of sins. And to make a reconciliation for iniquity. And to bring in everlasting righteousness. Isn't, these are the things that we are struggling with. Uh, this entire camp meeting. Because I know you and me. What do we want to experience in our lives? An end for? An end of? Sins. We need to fin we want to finish the transgression. We want to bring in everlasting righteousness and to you know all in, in all in, in, in all with all intents and purposes we want to see the end of this vision and this prophecy that we might be able to enjoy time with our Lord in the new heavens and in the new earth. And then he goes ahead and he tells them how this was supposed to be achieved. Uh, in verse 25 it says that know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, and the street shall be built again and the walls even in troublous times. What Gabriel is essentially telling these people is that this work, you can't continue this work forever. It is time bound. There are limits. You know, you, you won't just continue uh, playing with temptation and playing around with sin, hoping that one day, you know, you will bring an end to sin. This work is time bound. There is a time limit. You know, there is a probationary period that God has given you for this work to be done. Now, this is how the work is achieved. Uh, let's continue. He says that after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the but not for himself. And the people of the prince shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with flood unto the, shall be with a flood unto the end of the war. Diso uh, unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. Let me just read verse 27 and then we'll come back to that. And it says that, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate until the consummation and the, and the, deter and the, and the determined shall be, shall be poured upon the desolate. Let me just read verse 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. So verse 27 again. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one for one week. So all of this, you know, all of all of these duties, you know, all of these things that were supposed to happen to the Israelites, they were supposed to bring in everlasting righteousness. It was supposed to come through the agency of the Messiah. And how are they supposed to be sure that it was supposed to come through the agency of the Messiah? Because there was a covenant. And the Messiah was going to confirm this covenant. And by confirming this covenant. By confirming this covenant, by confirming the covenant, then this, uh, prom then this duty of finishing the transgression and making an end of sins and to make a reconciliation for sin and to bring in everlasting righteousness was supposed to be fulfilled. So, that, you know, so God is telling them that you have a time period where you're supposed to bring an end to sin. And after that time period, there will be judgment. And he says that that judgment will be utter destruction. It's complete destruction. It's complete in its nature. And the only way that they can be able to, to, to bring an end to sins, you know, to experience this righteousness, is through the work of the Messiah. I'll repeat. He says that the Messiah shall confirm the covenant. Now I ask you, which covenant? How many covenants do you know? How many covenants do you people know? Main covenant. Let's, let's involve each other. Let's involve each other. It's bad when I involve myself. How many? How many? How many? Uh, it's not a trick question. You guys don't want to answer. Okay, we will answer because I, I have limited time. If I if I extend my time, there will be there will be consequences. So there are two covenants, and the covenant that the Messiah was supposed to confirm with these people was the new covenant. Now let's let's read a few things about the new covenant. Let's jump to Jeremiah. Let's see what Jeremiah has to tell us about the new covenant. And let's see how it, how it, how it gels in well with the, with the entire discussion in Daniel. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 33. So we'll read, we'll start, we'll start. Uh, so let's, 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 let's start from verse 33. We could start from verse 31, but. Let's let's read look, let, let's let's start from verse 31. It says that behold the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that they 
that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was a husband to them, uh, saith the Lord. Okay. Uh, let's, let's just read that. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by hand to bring them out of the land of, of Egypt. Many people, you know, many people uh, unnecessarily jump to the conclusion and they say that, you know, now the new covenant is completely different from the old. You know, the old covenant was faulty. By just that verse, they say that the old covenant was faulty and now we are living in a new covenant. And the usual trope goes around when they say that, you know, uh, the, the old covenant was about laws and, and sacrifices and oblation. And the new covenant is about grace. You, you, you've not had, I'm just kidding, okay, okay, or you've not, or you've had it before. But you know that the, the, the obvious problem there is that who 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 gave the old covenant and everything, all the all the all the regulations and the and the sacrifices and the oblations that were associated with the old covenant? Who designed the entire system of the old covenant? It was was it Moses? Moses just went and imagined all of those things in his mind. If he did by there, that would be extremely brilliant. But he's, it's not Moses who did that. It was God who who gave the entire thing. It was a plan by, by God. So if the old covenant is faulty by that assumption, so who is faulty? It's God who made a mistake. No God who's tinkering with an expert. That's the conclusion. Most of the people who try to, you know, paint the, the old covenant in a bad light, that is the conclusion that they are making, is that God is, is faulty. But you read from Jeremiah, he says, he says that the problem is with, with the people because they broke the the covenant, the fault was not with God. But let's continue. It says that, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, that I will put my laws in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. In other, let me, let me, let me translate that for you. They will bring an end to sin. They will bring an end to transgression. And they will have everlasting righteousness. That is the same thing. Because it says that he will put their laws in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. You notice one thing here is that when, when initially when these laws were given, they were written in tables of stone. But now you see in the new covenant, you actually get into a deeper relationship with the law of God in that it is written in your heart. Now it's no longer external, it's actually written in your heart. It's actually manifested in your character. It's actually manifested in your innermost thoughts and intentions. When you wake up in the morning, you are like David. You meditate upon the law of God because it is written in your, in your heart. Now, the next question is, if a new covenant was supposed to be put in place, what are the necessary ingredients? In, let, let's, let's just read uh, Daniel 9. Let's look at uh, verse 27. It says that, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for a week, and in the midst of the... Uh, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one, for one week. Now, every time when a covenant is instituted, there are a few things that are necessary for that covenant to actually uh, actually come to, to force. The first thing is that, you, of course, you need the parties of the covenant. But uh, like the old covenant, there are, few, there are two key ingredients that are needed for this covenant to come into force. First thing that is needed is there the is need for a sacrifice. And the next thing that is needed is that there is need for mediator. Because this is a covenant between two parties, God and, and man. Now, you remember when you are reading in Isaiah chapter 59 and verse 2, it says that your sins have caused a separation between you and God, and your iniquities have hid his face from you, so that he will not be able to hear you. Now, this separation necessitates that they, there will be someone who will bridge the chasm between man and, and God. And when God is seeking to enter, to enter into a covenant relationship with man, is that it means that there is, there is you know, a mediator is necessary to ensure that this relationship is perfect. You know that this relationship actually works. Because you are dealing with two parties that are disparate. Two parties that are extremely different. So there is need for a mediator. And that mediator is who Daniel identifies as the Messiah. Let's, uh, I think Hebrews, Hebrews put it, puts it a bit clearly. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. And verse, let's read, uh, let's read from verse, let's read verse 7. And then we... I think we'll jump to verse 12. Let's, let's look at this. It says that... No, let's read verse 12. Let's start from verse 12. It says that, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered once into the holy place, having obtained an eternal redemption for us. 
For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of... Oh, no, no, no. I don't want, I don't want this one. This one, this one I'll use to illustrate uh, something else. Uh, let's, let's look at uh, Hebrews. Let's go to... Ah, verse chapter 8. That is what I wanted. Chapter 8. Chapter 8. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 8. And let's look at uh, verse... Let's look at the repetition of verse. Uh, let's look at chapter 8 and let's look at how it's repeated in verse, from verse 8 to verse, we, we continue on, onwards. So it says that, uh, this is Paul uh, speaking about the, the covenant. It says that, for if that first covenant had been fought, So I, I hope it's better right now, yeah? We can be able to communicate with, with each other clearly. So when, when you are reading about uh, uh, this, uh, this covenant that had to be instituted, there were two things that were necessary. First thing that was necessary was that there, there had to be a sacrifice that had to be offered to ratify the covenant. And then the next thing that had to happen was that they, there was need for a mediator. And let's, let's, let's just read how Paul... Uh, Let's read just how uh, how Paul how Paul uh, re, re says that it says that uh, let let's start from verse uh, let's start from verse seven from verse seven it says that for if that first covenant had been faultless then there should have then 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 should no place have been sought for the second for finding fault with them with them he said behold the days come say the Lord that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah not according with the, to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them. I, that I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not, said the, the Lord. So what, what, when he says that for if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. But what was the fault with the first covenant? It says that for finding fault with them. So the fault was not with the covenant that God instituted. The fault was with who? With the people. It was with the people, the people. And what was their fault? It says that they did not continue in my covenant. Now, when continue in verse 10, it says that, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, say the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Let me repeat that verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. So you see, you actually see that the design of the new covenant, as it is stated uh, perfectly in verse 11, is that I mean, verse 10, I mean, verse 10, where God says that I will put my laws into their minds, I will write them in their hearts, I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. What is the purpose of the new covenant? To ensure that God is our God and we are his people. That is terrible English, but it conveys the message. That is the purpose to bring a unity between man and, and God. How that is a difficult thing to achieve? That is a very difficult <laughs> because. There are differences. We are wicked. Let me tell you for a fact. We, our wickedness is, 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 is something that, you know, it can't be controverted. It, it, it is not a joke. When Romans chapter 3 tells us that all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God, that is legitimate stuff. So much to the point that for, ma for men to actually inherit everlasting life, what is the condition? What, what, what did Christ tell Nicodemus when Nicodemus... Uh, came to him by night, you know, so that they could have a candid discussion. What, what, what did Jesus Christ tell him? What, what, what needed to happen? What, what, what was this change that need, need, needed to happen in Nicodemus' life for him to be fit for the kingdom of heaven? Jesus Christ tell him that uh, unless you be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of, of God. So the, this change that needs to happen to men so that they can be united with God is likened to a new a new birth, a new recreation. But the goal of the new covenant is to actually make sure that God is united with, 
with men. And he says in verse 12 that, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And in Daniel chapter 9, you've read that the person who was supposed to enable all of these things to, you know, the person who was supposed to bring into a realization this old covenant was, is, is, is identified in Daniel chapter 9 as the Messiah. As the Messiah. Let me repeat that again. The person who is supposed to ensure that there is a unity between man and God, to ensure that we receive, you know, to ensure that, that, that this covenant is fulfilled, that God even has the opportunity to be merciful to our unrighteousness and to our sins and to remember our iniquities no more is the Messiah. So, Israel was not looking for a political king. They were supposed to look for a Messiah. They were supposed to look for someone who was supposed to ratify the new covenant. They were supposed to look for someone who was supposed to come and write God's laws in their, in their hearts. They were supposed to look for someone who was supposed to bring a unity between God and, and man. Now, you remember that verse in, uh, in Isaiah, or, or the one that is, that is, that is again uh, repeated in Matthew, uh, chapter, that should be Matthew 1, verse 23. Repeated again in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Let's, let's just read Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23. It says that, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted as God with. So we read in Hebrews that the work of the new covenant is to bring a unity between God and, and man. And then in, 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 Matthew, in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23, we say that the Messiah shall be called Emmanuel, which is interpreted as evidence that through Jesus Christ, it is possible for men to be united with God. That's your evidence. It's just there with us. And then in verse 21, it says that, and he shall bring forth a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So these people are supposed to look for someone who is supposed to save them from their sins. Not someone who is supposed to lead them in mighty conquest against the, the Romans. That was, they, were, they, were, they were actually looking forward for a Messiah. But you, find, you actually find out that through, uh, that, that in, 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 in this confusion, in the rut of their confusion, when the Messiah came to them, they expected someone different and they were not able to receive the benefits, you know, they were not able to receive uh, the promises and the benefits that had been promised in the new covenant. But what was their problem? What was the problem actually with, with Israel at this moment? Uh, let's, let's jump to Matthew. Let's go to Matthew chapter 15. As I look for a statement. Someone can help me read uh, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 9. There's a part of so much. Someone just help me read. Matthew 15, verse 9. Yes, please. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandment of men. men. Read also Matthew, I think, 22, verse 29. Matthew 22, 29. And it reads, uh, Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. So what, what was their fault? You know, many people, when many people are discussing, I think it's a mistake that we, we, are, we, 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 make, we make commonly. I, I don't know, probably, it's, it's, I, I have no idea. I can't really trace where, 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 where the origin of that mistake. But most of the time when you, when you, when you discuss about the mistakes that Israel did, or at times even the mistakes of the Pharisees, we tend to think that their biggest fault was the fact that they were legalists. I think that's a mistake that we, we make. And does it... I, okay, sorry. Uh, can anyone define that term legalism? It's a, it's a big term. It's a big term. But it has very... It, it does not produce fruits, you know. A big term, but extremely useless in its design. Yeah, it did... It, it, there's, there's nothing there's nothing in legalism but basically a legalist like if you if you are strict to the word is that this is someone who is that who is trying to attain righteousness through their own works now i ask you the question 
these Pharisees whom we've interacted with in the Bible, these people, were they legalists? Were they even trying to obey the law of God? When Jesus, was, when Jesus picked out the faults of the Pharisees, let me just engage your mind. What, 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 when, 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 he was, when, he was, when he was crying out against the Pharisees, what, did, what term did he use to describe them? Hypocrites. Hypocrites. They were hypocrites. A hypocrite, is, a hypocrite is someone who says one thing and then they go ahead and do the, the other. These people were, were sinners who are trying to hide and a garb of righteousness. And even this garb of righteousness that they had put on by what we've read, we've read from Matthew was not even from the word of God. It was not the commandment as they were given. Uh, it was not the commandment as it is stated in Moses. These people are hypocrites. They had substituted the word of God for traditions. They had substituted the scriptures for the doctrines and the commandments of, of men. And by mingling the scriptures with their own interpretation, they lost sight of the Messiah. And when Jesus Christ came, and when he came, and you remember when, 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 when he came to earth, he was supposed to come in and, and start off the new covenant and bring into force uh, the new covenant. When he came, they missed him. They missed his chance. And for their particular, and, 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 and for the Jews in particular, they were given a probationary period when they were supposed to anoint the most holy, when these particular things were supposed to happen, for, to happen to their nations. And when they missed their window of opportunity, the next thing that came was destruction. Now, this, there is something that I've just remembered. Perhaps I, I, I might be running ahead of myself. Let's read Hebrews chapter 17, and then we, we, we go back to, we, 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 we now uh, start, start making a summary of our lesson for today. So Hebrews chapter 9. Let, let me just, let, let's, Let's, let's just look at Hebrews chapter 9. I think let's read from verse 14. If you read, uh, I think, all the way to verse, to verse 18 will be, will be good. Hebrews 9 uh, from verse 14. Uh, let's read from verse 13 and then we continue. It says that, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer and the sprinkling of, of, and the, sprinkling of the unclean sanctify through the purifying of flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God to purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of a new testament that by means of death for the redemption of transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So they were supposed to receive the promise of, the, of, 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 of eternal inheritance through the death of Jesus Christ and through his work as a mediator. So the promise was only going to be fulfilled in them through the work of Jesus Christ. But they had to recognize that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. It says that for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the tester. For a testament is of, is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the tester lives. So for a testament, for, for the new covenant to come into force, they, there is necessity that there be the death of the Tester. And who, who promised the new covenant? It was, it was a promise of, of God. So if it says that, if it says in verse 16 that for where a testament is, there also must, there also must of necessity be the death of the tester. If God is the one who instituted the, 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 new, the new testament, who was supposed to die so that it comes to force? Himself. That, thank you. That is God. It is God. For a testament, is, okay, then in verse 18 it says that, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. Then verse 19 it says that, for when Moses had spoken every precept to the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet and wool and hyssop and sprinkled uh, both the book and the people, saying this is the blood of the testament which God had, which God had, had enjoined unto you. Then it goes ahead and says that moreover he sprinkled the blood, both the tabernacle and the vessels of the ministry. Now there is something very important in that verse. I think probably something that we miss. It says that after Moses had spoken every precept, what did he do? He took the blood of calves, of goats, with water and scarlet and wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and the people. So, you remember the, the, the reaction of the Jews after they had received the precept was that they presumptuously promised to do everything that they had been told. But you can actually see in this place, and we will, we will capture this later, I will just throw it 
and then tomorrow we'll go into it as we are working our way uh, through Revelation chapter 14. Now it might seem to be unrelated, but it will all make sense. It says that these people, the precepts were given, but immediately after the precepts are given, they are covered with blood. They are covered with blood. And this blood actually comes from, uh, it actually came from animals that are without blemish. Why? Because the, pre the precepts that they were given, those law, the law that they were given, the law was perfect. But did these people have any perfect thing to offer to God? Were they able to meet the perfection of the commandment? So God had made a provision through which these people could be able to meet the claims of the law. And that provision, according to Moses, it is symbolized by the blood of calves. So the natural response that these people were supposed to have was that they were supposed to be full of gratitude and full of faith. That even though God had given them his precepts, he had made a provision through which they could be able to meet the claims of the, of the law. That was the significance of that event. But in Hebrews chapter 9, in Hebrews chapter 9 tells you that when a testament is instituted, especially a testament between man and God, there are two things that are necessary. A mediator, number one, and the second thing is that there needs to be a sacrifice, the death of the tester. So in the minds of the Jews, what they were supposed to expect, they were supposed to expect someone who would come and be a mediator between them and God, and they were supposed to expect that this person who would come to be the mediator was supposed to offer some sort of sacrifice. And because in that Hebrews chapter 9, chapter, chapter 9 and verse 16, you say that there must, you know, a testament is only of force when after the death of the tester, they were supposed to expect that this person who was to come to be the mediator was supposed to offer the ultimate sacrifice was this a strange thing it was not a strange thing because by you know by the ministry that had been instituted of the sanctuary they knew they knew this they knew this that uh, they knew this they knew this they knew they knew that this was what they were supposed to expect but because they ignored the scripture because they taught for doctrine the commandments of god when the messiah came when he came to his own his own received him not but the gospel is that as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. So, so this, was, this was the general expectation of the Jews. And they made a mistake. They made a mistake. And after making that mistake, their probationary, the probationary period that was allotted to them and the work that they were supposed to do during that probationary period went undone. And we all know the sad story in 70 AD about the destruction of of Israel. Now, one common, uh, one common problem, I think that the, the underlying tone is that if we are ignorant of the work of Jesus Christ, especially his work as the Messiah, especially his work as the mediator, especially about his sacrificial offering, then it's highly likely that we will also, we will also miss, you know, we will also go through our probationary period and fail to do the work that God requires us to do, and at the very end of the day, we might end up being lost eternally. So they, they, of course, now the conclusion is that we need to be fully aware of our work, as, of, of the work of Jesus Christ. We need to fully acquaint ourselves with the work of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Now, let's, let's, let's now go back to Revelation. Let's, let's now go back to Revelation and then we conclude. So that is the conclusion. Uh, when Jesus Christ came during his first, when, when he, when he, when he, when he, at, at the first time when he, when he was coming, uh, during his, uh, his, his, uh, his first coming, or oh, let me, let me just read something. Hebrews chapter eight. Le, le, now it's, this is what Paul says. Of the things we have spoken, that is the things he, having spoke about Melchizedek as the priest says that we have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high, a minister of the true tabernacle, which the Lord preached and not man. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifice, where it is of necessity that this man have somewhat to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. And then he continues to say that they, are, that, they, that they serve as an example and a shadow of heavenly things. What Christ came to do during the first time is that he came to offer a sacrifice. And by offering that sacrifice, he would ascend to the true tabernacle and start his work as a priest. That was, that, was, that was the reason for his first coming. Because it says that a priest cannot get into the first tabernacle without gifts, without sacrifice, without the blood. And that's what Jesus Christ came to do during, the, during his first coming. He came to offer a perfect sacrifice that he may ascend to heaven and start his work as a priest. 
and the Jews completely missed this fact and they missed the, 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 the probationary period just went, uh, the time went and improved and at the very end of the day we know the sad story of the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, revelation and we will end with our key text. There is an interesting thing about revelation and this will build our, our discussion for the entire day as we, as we, as we dive deep. There is a very interesting uh, structure uh, that is there in Revelation. I'll just read one thing and I would, I would indulge your thoughts for one second. Uh, Revel let's look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19. It says that, uh, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in your right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, and the seven stars, and the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which you saw are the seven churches. Now, I think I don't know if, 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 if the structure of the sanctuary is, is, is foreign. Is it, is, it, is it a foreign concept or are we, are we aware like just how, how it was organized? I think we are all aware how it was organized, yeah? Okay, if, if, if it's strange, you can always uh, refer to Hebrews chapter 9. It gives you a very uh, compressed understanding. Now, when, when you see these seven candlesticks and Jesus Christ walking in the midst of these seven candlesticks, where is he? Uh, in which apartment is he in that sanctuary? In the holy place, right? So in the holy place. Now, uh, we, we, we might not have time to build this. Probably we'll, we'll, we'll start it off as an introduction for tomorrow. But the revelation, revelation actually follows the steps that Jesus Christ is making in the sanctuary. It actually follows his ministry in the sanctuary. That's why many people call it the fourth gospel. Because the first four, I mean the, the fifth gospel. The first four gospels only end at his work on earth but you don't know what he's doing in heaven. And Revelation actually gives you an insight of the work that Jesus Christ continue, is continually doing uh, in heaven. And uh, let's, let's, let's go to 11 uh, of Revelation and verse, uh, verse 19. 11 of Revelation and verse 19. Uh, it says that, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightning and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and a great and a great hail. So it says that the temple was open and what was seen in that temple at this moment? The Ark of His Testament. Now, which, which place? The Ark of, of the Testament was in which place? It was in the most holy. It was in the second apartment of the sanctuary. So by the time when we are dealing with Revelation chapter, the, the events are following Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19, at which point in the sanctuary are we at? It's the most holy. So we are dealing with the services at the most holy Holy place. And, the, and then let's look at Revelation chapter 15. Or let's look at 15 and, and verse 9. Or, or, or we hold on to that thought, we'll build, we'll build. Let's hold on to that thought and we'll build on it uh, tomorrow. Let's hold because. I think uh, we've exhausted, we've exhausted our time. We've exhausted our time. So let, let's 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 just lay a conclusion. Let's let's just uh, put a conclusion uh, to this matter, and then we'll continue with the with the with the thought uh, tomorrow. We'll continue with the thought tomorrow. Now, we we read uh, from Revelation chapter six and verse seventeen. Let's just draw the conclusion. Uh, Revelation chapter six and verse seventeen says that for the great day of his wrath is come, and we shall be able to to stand. And uh, that, that, that is the question that is asked. And Revelation chapter 7 answers the question of who will be able to stand. And it presents that answer in the form of the 144,000. And the same thing is repeated to us. It's repeated and expanded in Revelation chapter 14. And if you look at Revelation chapter 14 from verse 1 to verse 5, it is the, 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 the same people are presented here as the 144,000. And these people are presented just after we are introduced to Revelation chapter 13, which introduces us to the two powers who will engulf this world, to the two powers and to the crisis that will engulf this world just before Christ's second, second coming. So tomorrow, this is what we are going to do tomorrow. Tomorrow we are going to, to now look at the context of Revelation chapter 13 and verse 14. I believe by laying the context, then I, we can be able to, to study the three angels' messages at our free time because we are just here to lay down the foundation. And we look at uh, why it is important for us to to understand the work of Jesus Christ and to understand his work as the priest. We look at why it is important for us to understand his ministry 
in the sanctuary and we look at the mistakes that we are bound to make if we do not follow Jesus Christ through his ministry in the sanctuary. But there are a few, the, the only conclusion, I'll read one statement and then we make a conclusion. It says that the Jews who rejected the life given at Christ's first advent refused to believe on him as the savior of the world and could not receive pardon through through him. It says that the Jew, this is Christ in his sanctuary, page 108, paragraph 2. It says that the Jews who rejected the light given at Christ's first advent refused to believe on him as a, as a savior of the world and could not receive pardon through, through him. So when Christ came, they did not understand the nature of his work. They did not understand his character as the Messiah. And it says that because they were unable to understand, they were unable to have faith in him and they could not be able to receive pardon through, through him. And you know, as we end, as we, Revelation chapter 16 has left us with a question, that the day of God's wrath is, is coming. Who will be able to, to stand? It's a time when, a time is coming when probation will, will close. And the question is that who will be able to, to stand? Of course, we, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can jump and make conclusions and we know that the righteous will, will stand. But it's important for us to understand how it is, how, how we can be. Righteous. And in Revelation chapter 7, we ended, it ends, it ends at saying, it ends at saying something important that fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment is, is come. Now, it is important. It is also imperative. You know, it is, it is not, not, not really, that, that's a wrong word. It is important for us to understand the work of Jesus Christ. It is important for us to understand the times that we are living in. It is important for us to understand the nature of his work in the heavenly sanctuary because we need to understand what work, you know, we are living in a different time from the Jews. We are living in a different, uh, I think, not, not dispensation, really. We are, we are living in a different time. And if we do not understand the work that Jesus Christ is doing for us on our behalf, the work that he is doing in the heavenly sanctuary, if we do not understand the phase of his, you know, the phase, which phase of his ministration is in, then we run the risk of failing to fulfill our mandate. We run the risk of failing to understand these three angels' messages. And we fail... We, 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 we might be at, at a risk of being these grapes that will be taken outside the city and be trodden at the wine press. So this is what we will do tomorrow. Having gone through the new covenant and understanding that uh, the promises of the new covenant are to make people righteous, and this righteousness is achieved through the work of Jesus Christ, through his sacrificial offering and through his work as, through his work as the mediator. Tomorrow, we will dive deep into that question. The day of his wrath is coming. And who will be able to stand? And by answering that question, then we'll be able to understand why the, three, why the first angel's message tells us to fear God and to give him glory. I, I'm pretty sure you, you want to fear God, yeah? You, do you want to give him glory? Do you want to understand why it says that the hour of his judgment has come? Do you want to worship your God intelligently? Then I think I will invite you to join me, to join me tomorrow. And then we'll dive, we'll, you know, we'll take a deep dive into Revelation chapter 14 and verse 6. But we'll take a different, we'll, we'll, we, will, we, will, we will deal with it in a different way. We'll look at it according to the light of the sanctuary. We'll look at it in the light of the sanctuary. Because all of these things are portrayed in the light of the sanctuary. So tomorrow, we have, we, our, our first introduction will be to look at the structure of Revelation chapter 14 the entire revelation in the light of the sanctuary, and then we'll build this thought. We will understand how the new covenant can become a living and a practical experience in our lives. I hope we are we're excited for the study for tomorrow. Yeah, I hope the study for today has also been edifying. But remember this, the duty rests heavily on Jesus Christ and he's able to present you faultless and blameless before his father's throne. He is our mediator. So tomorrow we'll look at, at that bit. And then we continue. Okay, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, what in heaven, uh, we've been able at least to, you know, lay some groundwork. And uh, our prayer is that we may, you know, we, we want to fully understand the work that you're doing uh, on our behalf and on behalf of the entire universe because you know that your, your atonement is, is, is not just for, for this planet but for the entirety of, of, of your creation. And we wish to follow your footsteps. We wish to be those people who follow the Lamb uh, wherever he goes. And when you, when you come to earth, when you ascend into the temple, when you move into the uh, second apartment of the sanctuary to start the work of, the, of judgment, we wish to be those people who follow you. And you've provided us a good opportunity to study, a good opportunity, you know, to, to, to exercise our minds in, in righteousness. And our prayer is that you, you may give us your spirit and that he may be our teacher, that these truths may be settled in our minds and at the very end of the day we may practice everything that you teach us. 
for this I pray in Jesus' name. So God bless you. We'll, we'll see each other tomorrow. God so. again. Uh, we'll turn to him 600. So he promises given. And as we sing the third stanza, uh, the messengers ministers will come for night. 600. So he promises given.
panawangu Umeni chunguza sana Mimi mda mda ifu bana Sifa imelezo ku Tambi zangu panawangu Zimeni ziba macho Niangazi e panawangu Ili nione tena Nipanye bwana wangu Natumani sana nione Nigusi macho bwana Kama ulivyo gusa batimayo Natumani nione Upufa wangu uipanye Na kulili
would you say to that again? Uh, we'll sing him, we'll turn to him, to 12. It is almost time for the Lord to come. To 12. Shout aloud, O sun, 
Yesu akwita kwa upole piga hatua uje kwake msemeza nena ye wewe uliye tumbukizo ndani ya maji ukapa utatembea na ye imekuwa je ule yapatizo udhambi ndetena wewe jichunguze we urudi kwake Yesu akwita kwa upole piga hatua uje kwake msemeza nena ye wewe uliye tumbukizo ndani ya maji ukapa utatembea na ye imekuwa je ule yapatizo udhambi ndetena wewe jichunguze we urudi kwake Ufanye matengenezo ukarije Nema isha yake Mungu maisha tunayo Ishi ni mapeto Kama ayetado Ayetado nyoka Ujitabe Wewe ujichunguze Utambuwe ni wapi ulipukusia Ufanye matengenezo ukarije Nema isha yake Mungu maisha tunayo Ishi ni mapeto Kama ayetado Ninajivundia 
Ukristo nilio na uko ni mimi ni mimi na wa Mungu nimekitaka mbizi zini mwake Yehova sina hofu mimi na burudika ole wako we ole ya pambavu ukala chapiko hivi rudi kwa kelo msengeza ne Mfanya matengenezo hukarejele Maisha yake mungu maisha tunayo Ishi ni mapito kamwe ayate tumu yoto nyoka Ujitahidi uwe ujichunguze Utambue ni wapi ulipokosea Mfanya matengenezo hukarejele Maisha yake mungu maisha tunayo Ishi ni mapito kamwe ayate tumu